So welcome to everyone to this seminar on empirical data on annulment of international awards, what to learn from it, ARP dossier and beyond. In the arbitration context, more than in any other area of law, experiential accounts have been relied on to justify theoretical constructs as if they were some kind of truth, even though experiential accounts are but personal narratives or stories that convey an individual subjective experience. Experiential accounts are based on personal recollection and interpretation of events and certain situations. They are subjective in nature. This does not mean, of course, that they cannot at times provide valuable insight into a particular event or phenomenon, but they may not always be reliable or accurate because they are, may well be influenced by a person's emotional state or memory bias or may be influenced by factors such as memory distortion, I have a lot of those, or selective recall. Still, in the arbitration context, these shortcomings seem to be overlooked and the experiences of a few are elevated to universal truth. This obviously cannot be. And fortunately, in recent years, the departure from reliance on experiential accounts can be observed. And this is why today the arbitral community is looking for numbers, figures and statistics which are more objective because they are based on observable facts and are not influenced by personal biases or opinions or the memory distortions which I just have referred to. I'm of course referring to empirical data. That meaning information that has been gathered through observation and or direct or indirect measurements. Information that is obtained through systemic and controlled methods which in itself ensures that the results can be replicated and therefore, and this in my opinion is very important, verified by other researchers. And there's evidence of this thirst for empirical data in the field of arbitration. Think of the increasing data collection efforts undertaken by scholars from different countries who independently of each other have started to publish their findings on various arbitration-related issues, including, of course, on today's topic, meaning on annulment of arbitral awards in various jurisdictions. And today, we are here to talk about some of these efforts and what their results may teach us and how they can be used in practice. This being said, allow me to introduce today's speakers. The first talk will be given by Dr. Monique Sasson, an independent arbitrator at Arbitra and of counsel at DR Arbitration and Litigation in Italy, who together with three colleagues has just published, and when I mean just, I really mean just now, a paper entitled Empirical Analysis of National Courts, Vacater and Enforcement of International Commercial Arbitration Awards in the most recent, recent issue of Journal of International Arbitration. Marco Serenia, an Italian lawyer and graduate student here at NYU, will talk about the data he collected regarding the annulment issues in Italian, in Italy and in the Italian context, and how he did so. Bujana Bilankov, a Serbian dispute resolution lawyer and graduate student here at NYU, will introduce ArpDossier.com, a website focusing on empirical data collection of which she is the chief editor, and comment on one of the reports already issued, specifically the Singaporean one. Murtuza Federal, who joins us from India, is a solicitor specializing in dispute resolution, where he is a named partner in the firm of Federal, company, Federal and Company, a boutique firm in Bombay. Gautam Buta I was told how to pronounce it. I have to uh, Bhattacharya. A member of ARP Dossier's advisory board is an international arbitration partner at Reed Smith, who will, towards the end of today's session, talk about specific aspects relating to the situation in India and the reports that was actually the report that were already published. Last, but certainly not least, allow me to also welcome Devash Saraf, 
the co-founder of Arptosee.com, who is a graduate student at a different school, <laughs> to whom we owe, of course, what I think will be the go-to tool for this type of empirical data. He will guide us through the future of Arptosee.com. But a warm welcome also to Devan Jalan, whom I see in the audience, Arptosee's chief executive officer. With this, I give you the floor, Monique. Thank you very much, Franco, and thank you very much uh, to everybody for coming here and sharing with me my experience on empirical data. This is the result of one year work. So <laughs> um, it's, uh, it has been a long journey. Uh, let me start first by defining uh, what uh, did we do, so starting with the database. So, of course, uh, the uh, aim of our research was what Franco exactly uh, indicated, which is to go above and beyond what is anecdotes, because what we are left really are just stories from uh, colleagues in other jurisdictions. We um, looked at the uh, cluearbitration.com uh, database, so I'm not here to advertise anything, but I have just to highlight how uh, the database was put together. We looked at there, we had there 1,000 a little more uh, discord judgments, half of them on setting aside the procedure and half on uh, recognition and enforcement. In terms of number, we have a good uh, representation worldwide. So we had 100 different nationality claimant side and over 100 different nationality respondent side. Of course, the US is uh, uh, the biggest, um, has the biggest share from respondent and also from uh, claimants, over eight, between eight and nine percent on respondent side and the same percentage on claimant side. The majority of uh, uh, the proceedings behind um, the judgments are uh, administered proceedings. We had, strangely, over 100 different institutions. 20% lion side, so is ICC. Uh, ICDR, strangely, despite being a very high percentage of cases in the US, wasn't so well represented. But remember that this is a sort of, uh, we had 78 um, countries. So we look at the database of 78 countries. Of course, there is a selection bias. I'll tell you from the beginning what is um, our, uh, might be our problem with the database because how is the database construed is by having each reporter for each jurisdiction selecting what are the most interesting awards and what the most interesting court judgment relating to them. So, of course, Every um, reporter has to identify what are the most interesting uh, court judgments. And this is because we don't want, we did, I mean, Kluwer didn't want to have uh, national cases. So, for example, even if you have, you, just to give you a quick example, you would have 10 cases per year from France, probably 30 to 40 cases per year from the US. This is just to broadly um, to understand how all these cases are put together. Lots of cases from Russia, lots of cases from China, um, and other big jurisdictions, which sometimes, so when you're speaking about anecdotes, you often know about France, Switzerland, and the uh, United Kingdom, and the US. You don't know much about other countries. Uh, so this, what we, um, this is then why we looked at this uh, database. I thought it was also interesting um, when we looked at this to see if there were many governmental parties. They are only in 6% of the cases. So again, um, the uh, database is all about commercial arbitration. So because we looked at that uh, there are so many researches on empirical researches and studies in investment treaty arbitration, we didn't want to go there. We thought that uh, where is a gap in the market is really the uh, commercial side. So we looked at the institution, we didn't see, for example, so we were thinking, um, so when we try to test all the data, that, for example, there would be a home bias. We couldn't find that in our, in our number. Then we thought that maybe, you know, some institutions do better than other in terms of enforcement or in terms of set aside. I have to say we couldn't test that with the data. But for us, what was one of the major points was, again, I mean, thinking about anecdotally, 
what you would say is that we have the New York Convention. The New York Convention is very good and provides for a quick and uh, a rapid enforcement of all the awards. What's happening on the setting aside the front? Do we have the same? So now the data tells us that yes, we do have the same. Despite the fact that all the countries are different and they all have their own law and set of law for setting aside. Of course, we know about the UNCTAD, so the fact that the model law has been adopted in several countries. We were expecting to see from the data a big discrepancy from setting aside and a sort of a home bias against Foreign, con foreign parties and uh, recognition and enforcement where you have a very good tested convention. The issue is that the data didn't tell us that. So it's equivalent. Setting aside and uh, recognition and enforcement came out with the same amount. So you have in 70% of the cases a chance of recognizing and enforcing a, an award. 30% it would not be enforced. And the same percentage, maybe a little less, 26%, it, with regard to setting aside the uh, cases. So in that case, vacatur was granted in 26% of the cases, so it's specular to the recognition and enforcement. And we thought that that was uh, um, quite striking. So when uh, uh, academics, uh, they plead to have similar set-aside rules, we sure, of course, we should have similar set-aside rules, but the reality is that all the courts across the globe are really trying to enforce uh, um, arbitration award. So um, we then uh, looked at specific uh, uh, issues. For, so for example, we looked at public policy. So public policy is used in almost 40% of the uh, proceedings concerning recognition and enforcement, and similar number for setting aside. So of course, the definition of public policy that we encounter is sometimes a truly international definition of public policy, sometimes is a less international definition of public policy. So with public policy, there is always the conviction, at least between, among practitioners, that what, what, is, what, what the losing part is trying to do is try to channel, really, a review uh, um, of, you know, on the merits. So that is what public policy is trying to uh, achieve. Were they successful? The data tells us not really. So one in three cases is, been, is a case where public policy has been uh, raised, and the success rate is between 19 20%. So of course, there are some cases where it has been uh, looked at, but these cases are not that many. So in numerical terms, we weren't um, so, um, so we, we weren't uh, so discouraged in a sense. So public policy has been uh, used, um, of course, by the majority correctly. With public policy, what then we looked? We looked at uh, um, what was the approach of the court. Was that a maximalist approach or was that a minimalist approach? Which means, for example, in a case of corruption, what would the court do? Would they take for granted what the arbitrators did? And so if the arbitrators looked at the issue of corruption, for example, would the court look at it again or not? Of course, this is a time of dis many discussion on legitimacy of arbitration. So this is very important to understand exactly what courts are doing. And in that, we saw two trends in our decision upholding the um, public policy um, issue and the decision where either to um, give deference to the arbitral tribunal and this is very much the uh, what has happened for example in England where the where if the issue of corruption has been raised before the arbitral tribunal the UK court would say not for me this I'm not looking at it instead in several jurisdictions following the French approach the French courts would look at what was put in front of the arbitral tribunal and would do a sec would take a second look. Now, what is why public policy is so important? Because again, it is a way to have a review on the merits of the award. On the other hand, what the courts who are following the maximalist approach are doing, they're doing mainly, they're saying, well, this is the basic fundamental rights 
of our state. So we understand autonomy, but we have to reach a balance between autonomy of arbitration and the, um, and, and the fact that we have to guarantee the basic fundamental notions of uh, arbitration. The other, um, one of the other um, issue that we looked at is about set aside awards that are then enforced in uh, other jurisdiction. Why we thought that that was important? Because of course, so we all know the French doctrine by which uh, even if an award is set aside, the French court would review the award and would say whether the award is enforceable or not. But of course, this is not the same approach adopted by other countries. And this is becoming very important in investment arbitration because as you all know, investment arbitration intra-EU is forbidden and uh, I mean, it's forbidden, it's a big word, but in reality is uh, contrary to principles of European law. And uh, uh, so when there is an award in investment treaty arbitration, the court would uh, set aside, the court, the, if the court, the seat of the arbitration is in Europe, and of course if the award is not uh, rendered in, under the ICSID umbrella, then there is a, I would say, very high chance that the award is going to be set aside, I would say, between 90 and probably 100%. Now, if that's the case, what's happening if the award is uh, taken here? And there are already some cases that are stayed in the United States about investment treaty arbitration. What would happen there? So in that case, our research, for example, is useful because it shows that in the majority of the cases in this across, across the globe have said that only if there was a violation of basic fundamental right, the set aside award would be enforced in another jurisdiction. So then the next test would be for us to see what's happening in the investment regime and whether the US court, for example, or other courts outside the European Union would say that the award set aside is really in violation of basic fundamental rights. So this is just two examples, public policy and set aside, that I wanted to raise here because I thought that they were very interesting in highlighting what is, uh, um, wh why is necessary a research on empirical uh, data, why we need to have data backing up and trying to have predictors on, on whether an argument is successful or not. Of course, it is difficult to do it with such, such a limited database, but we have to remember that judgment in common law jurisdiction are public, and we are all aware of them. In civil law, they're not automatically public, so it's very difficult to look for them, and very difficult to find them, and be, make sure that everybody is aware of this judgment. So, apart from countries where, for example, the usual suspects, so of course, in Switzerland, in France, all this judgment will be immediately made available to everybody because there is an interest in the community to make sure and to show that the country is supporting arbitration. There are many other countries where we don't have the same. So then the last point, and this would be um, my last point, was on um, what are the friendliest court to arbitration and what are the less friendless court to arbitration. So uh, strangely, in our research, the, um, the numbers on France, and this is why we dedicated a chapter on France, were not so um, welcome, not welcome, enforcing arbitration or denying setting aside uh, proceedings. Um, of course, we looked at all the data, and actually our data, especially in set-aside proceedings, matched the statistical data released by the Paris Court of Appeal, where the percentage of setting aside award is 26%. So this might seem, again, a very high number for a country that has been always in the forefront, always supporting arbitration and all of that. But we have to go again back to what I said before about the maximalist approach and the minimalist approach. So the fact that courts are uh, reviewing arbitration awards and are deciding whether to set aside or not, whether to enforce or not, in a sense goes also to the legitimacy of its, these proceedings in the sense that arbitration is autonomous, 
is there, but this doesn't mean that the courts are not looking of what the uh, arbitrators are doing and what the parties are doing. And the courts should and will intervene in certain um, cases. So again, this, I think, uh, that again, um, raise issues also on what is the role of the courts. I mean, <clears throat> do the court intervene in <clears throat> major, um, in front of the breach of major principles, or do they not, do they step back? Because the fact that the courts would always step back and just rubber stamp any enforcement or just deny any set aside, is this really goes to the, um, leg this would help really the legitimacy of arbitration. We heard a lot about it in investment treaties, saying that this is all a hidden procedure and is outside the control of the court. So I think that our data show that this is not really true, that when there is a fundamental principle, then all the courts would step up and would be more interventionist. Thank you very much. And it makes more sense to have this data rather than rely on anecdotes. Marco, you went about collecting the data in a different way. So please, you have 10 minutes. Yeah. So thank you very much. First of all, Professor Ferrari for inviting me to this conference. Thank you to all in the attendance. And I would like also to thank my friends and colleagues of ARB Dossier, who really greeted me as, as a part of the ARB Dossier's family. Um, I have to say that after six months at NYU, it's nice to be on this side of the desk for once. Um, so what I'm going to talk about quickly, I'm going to provide a quick overview and background to the study that we conducted in Italy. I will illustrate some of the main results of this study, and if, eventually I will provide some, a few personal considerations before wrapping up. So starting from the background and the subject matter of the study, um, the study concerned setting aside proceedings before Italian courts of appeals. It was a study run by a private law firm with the support and help of the Milan Chamber of Arbitration, which is the main arbitral institution of the country, which helped liaising with the, with the courts to obtain the data. So the amount of data was quite massive, I would say. We took the six, I would say the six main Italian city, but for Rome, because they didn't want to give us the data. And I think this goes back to what Monique said about the availability of, of the judgments in civil law countries. And overall, we analyzed, in a team of six people, we analyzed almost uh, 1,500 judgments of setting aside proceedings um, dealt with by those courts. Uh, as mentioned by Professor Ferrari, I was a trainee back in the day, so I had to do the legwork. I had to go around Italy and gather all those data. And I have to say that was by far the funniest part of the whole study. But it was also interesting in terms of seeing how the judiciary is open, in a sense, to be kind of controlled and checked um, by the outside world and by the arbitral community. So having said that, uh, before moving to the results, just um, a preliminary clarification that I think is important as to the source of the data. Um, as Monique mentioned, her, the report that she just presented was mainly focused on the judgments or, that were selected from Clover arbitration, so a legal database. What we did instead was going, in a sense, directly to the source, so going to the court and taking the judgments. This, of course, has pros and cons. As to the upside, you can kind of take off the table that selectivity bias that Monique mentioned, because naturally, when you go into a legal database, there is an inherent bias in the criteria used to select specific judgments to be published in the database, whereas we went to the courts and just took all the data, all the judgments that they had on the subject matter. On the flip side, however, you, besides the fact that you need to deal with the Italian Courts of Appeal, which is not that easy, um, I think the most important aspect, if you work in a jurisdiction like Italy, which has no dichotomy between national and international arbitrations, so the distinction is between an Italian seated arbitration or a foreign seated arbitration, well, in those circumstances, it becomes much more difficult to kind of single out international arbitration cases. So I think this is something to keep in mind also for future research. Having said that, um, I would quickly deal with the most important results of the, of the study, especially in relation on the setting aside proceedings. Um, so starting from the, I think, the data that counsel and especially legal counsel and parties care the most about, so the percentage of success of the challenge, we saw that actually the Italian courts rarely annul 
arbitral awards um, arising from arbitration city in Italy. Just to give you a few numbers, um, the annulment were grant, the annulment uh, applications were granted only in 10% of the cases, and we had we saw 4% of partial annulments, which is possible under Italian law. So it's those are I would say like 10 percentage points less than France or the international trend that Monique described before. Um, another set of data that we analyzed and we found quite interesting was to say the success rate of the of the grounds in the sense that we analyze which are the grounds most invoked by counsel before courts of appeals and which are the grounds that are most successful and what we found out is that counsel tend to invoke grounds that are comparatively way less successful so just to give you two examples uh, under Italian law it's possible to challenge an award on the ground that there are, were alleged in contradictory statements in the reasoning part and in the dispositive part so this ground was invoked by counsel in 339 cases and was successful all in six cases, accounted to 1.8% 1, 1 of, of success rate. To the contrary, other narrower grounds were way more successful comparatively. For instance, the fact that the award was in contrast with the res judicata was raised only 13 times, but it was successful twice, accounting for 15%. So I think this is a point of attention that is quite important for practitioners where, for instance, drafting their pleadings or thinking about the strategy on a setting aside application. Then, last but not least, um, in cauda venenum, someone say, like the poison is in the tail, the length of the setting aside proceedings. We all know here, I believe, that Italian courts are not famous for being quick, and the results of our study kind of confirm this tendency we had a significant discrepancy among different courts of appeals. Uh, some of them, I think they were more or less on par with the best international practice. We had a couple of courts of appeals who dealt on average with the cases uh, on or below uh, two years. But we also had very bad examples, like three or more years, and there was one case of an average duration of seven years. Now, it's true that under Italian law, the setting aside proceedings does not do not automatically entail the stay of the enforcement, but of course, the, the duration of the proceedings is something, is a factor that should be considered and is some, a leverage that the award debtor might have vis-a-vis -vis the award creditor. Now, before wrapping up, and I would like just to make two personal considerations uh, arising from my experience of doing the research like firsthand and preparing also for this conference. Um, the first one relates to the trend that Professor Ferrari mentioned at the outset of this increasing presence of unrelated and independent empirical studies on data and international arbitration. What I found reading those other reports that are gonna be presented here today, it was on the one side, it was kind of reassuring that there were converging results. So we found very many results that were kind of similar throughout the different reports. On the other side, what I think was pretty useful for me was to see how you could benefit also from the wisdom of originality of other researchers in terms of possible categories or areas of study. So for instance, to mention uh, Dr. Sasson's report, they had this study that I believe quite interesting. Uh, they tried to uh, investigate whether there is a tendency of counsel to pair grounds, like to uh, raise one ground with one other and how this lasts in practice. So this is something we didn't think about, and I think it, it should be useful to analyze with the data that we have. What we did, for instance, instead, was to determine whether the composition of the arbitral tribunal, namely whether there was a sole arbitrator or a free member arbitral tribunal, somehow affects the likelihood of challenge of the arbitral award, the likelihood of, of a successful challenge to the arbitral award. And the results we had was that this is not the case. There was no impact of the composition of the arbitral tribunal on the likelihood of success. And I believe, and again, this links back to what Professor Ferrari mentioned at the outset, this idea of anecdotal experience. Like what I've been hearing so far in my experience in arbitration is that free member tribunal tend to produce a better award. It, it could well be, but the data, at least from the perspective of the setting aside, does not, do not show that. Now, one, one last point that I would like to make, and I think it's, it's a broader point, and it goes to the relationship between litigation and arbitration. Uh, I believe the, we all agree that uh, 
arbitration could and should be a valid alternative to dispute resolution, and especially in those countries, such as Italy, where courts have an incredible backlog, it could really be a, a valuable alternative. Now, one aspect, however, and I know this is more controversial that I would like to touch upon, is that under Italian law, for instance, the arbitral award has the same effects of a civil judgment, basically. As I see it, I think it makes sense as a counterweight for this that the state or the judiciary retain a certain minimum degree of judicial control down the line at the post-award enforcement stage. So I think, Monique, before us, what is the role of courts? From my experience and from the experience of the research we, we had, the role of courts was to intervene only in those very extreme circumstances. I will close with one example. We had only four cases out of almost 1,500 that were set aside on the basis of lack of partiality of arbitrators. Well, just to give you an idea, one of those cases was a case where one of the arbitrators was the counsel of one of, was the uncle of the counsel of one of the parties. Now, I believe, I mean, they're going to talk about our jurisdiction, arbitration friendly jurisdiction, but I believe that a jurisdiction that accepts this type of award to come into this legal system is not something that we, we want to have. That said, I would like to thank you all for the attention and I give the floor back to Professor Ferrari. Thank you very much. I learned a lot, of course, I saw your paper and I read through it. Um, thank you very much to show that, as I mentioned in another occasion, it makes sense that we, in all of the countries we have looked at, or that have been looked at, find that certain arbitral awards are being annulled. I think the last example you showed um, makes clear that we need courts to annul certain arbitral awards. So I do not think that um, a arbitration-friendly jurisdiction is just a jurisdiction where no award is annulled. That cannot be and should never be. Thank you very much. And I ask our two colleagues who will start with the ARP dossier um, reports to come to the front. Just so that the audience know, we have a lot of time for question and answers. So if you have questions, please um, wait until the end. We need to wait until the end because um, this allows us to somehow manage time a little better because we want to make sure that everybody gets his or her 10 minutes. And yes, I see you are looking out, of course. All of our classrooms look like this. Okay, <laughs> just want you to know, okay, that's NYU. That's why even people from other schools come down here. I mean, <laughs> obviously. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ferrari, for this opportunity, and thank you all for, for, for coming here to, to be with us and to discuss the, the importance of empirical data in arbitration. So my speech will be divided in several parts. I would begin first by emphasizing the general importance of data uh, in arbitration. I would then briefly touch upon the arbitration friendliness issue that can come across in these matters. Um, and I would then turn to ARB dossier to briefly tell you the the conclusions that we reached uh, when it comes to Singapore jurisdiction and ultimately uh, what is the future of ARP dossier. So uh, I would just begin by saying that numbers often speak better than words. And um, these kind of empirical data that we have here is, in my uh, opinion, what we really need when it comes to our, our practice. Um, if I may follow up on what Professor Ferrari, uh, Dr. Sasson, and Marco have just said, um, this everything actually comes comes to to the screening of of a particular jurisdiction, and um, judicial screening can best be done by looking at courts' decisions and by analyzing what courts said on arbitration-related matters. And it can also be very important from the perspective of finding out what happened actually in arbitration because a lot of arbitrations are indeed confidential and through these post-award control mechanisms of the courts you get to find out what happened in arbitration. Um, the, the importance of 
um, of this judicial screening is very important when it comes to international arbitration uh, because the more we know, um, the better informed decisions we can give and also our clients. And I'm pretty sure that everyone here has at least once faced the question of the client, uh, where should we put the seat of arbitration or where should we enforce the, the award? Um, and as speakers before me said, um, a lot of our responses came from anecdotal stories and from our personal experience, the personal experience of people whom we trust and limited data that we have. But um, I truly believe that this is not enough and that um, there is, as Professor Ferrari mentioned, there is a true need for more empirical data in international arbitration. So practitioners would deeply appreciate of having more data from various jurisdictions that would analyze the enforcement of awards, the annulment um, of awards, how courts react, how, how they appoint arbitrators. All of this can be very important also for arbitration friendliness. And for the purpose of this conference, I will not deal with, um, with all the parameters that make jurisdiction arbitration friendly. But what I do believe is that one, um, one parameter that everyone should have, should take into account is uh, how do the courts of the seat act when it comes to annulment of the award. So when you screen a jurisdiction, um, I believe that screening its part from, from the annulment perspective is also very important. Um, because as Professor Ferrari mentioned, um, not all awards should be there. Some of them should really be annulled. And the fact that there is zero percentage of annulment in jurisdiction does not have to mean that that jurisdiction is arbitration friendly because also as pointed by, by Marco, uh, some awards really need to be, really need to be annulled. And um, we should also take into account what, what are the reasons for annulling? Um, how did the court, uh, approach these, these, these issues. Uh, were courts' judgments reasonable? That is something that we should all take into account when considering whether jurisdiction is arbitration friendly or not. And this ultimately enables us to reflect upon the arbitration stat status in one jurisdiction and to, to deepen our arbitration know-how, if I might say so. Um, so having said this, um, I would now turn to the ARB dossier and said that I discussed all these issues with Davarush a couple, a couple of months ago and um, we really realized that this is where the future stands and that we should really um, deal more with these matters. What I liked is the fact that one of their first reports was the report about Singapore, which is, as we all know, the number one seat and arbitration hub in the world. Um, and um, the, the approach that their courts take to, for the annulment of awards is something that is extremely important. We all know also that um, in High Court of Singapore, there are judges who, are, who have serious experience in arbitration matters, and those judges get to be elected to decide then upon arbitration-related matters. So that is an issue that is very important. Uh, ARB dossier's uh, report about Singapore dealt with 25 applications that, would, that were filed in um, 2021 and that ended up before High Court and Court of Appeals in, of Singapore. Um, Singapore is dual track, has a dual track arbitration system, so one, one law deals, it's called Arbitration Act, it deals with domestic arbitration, the other one, International Arbitration Act, deals with international arbitration. And for the purposes of this talk, I will just be focusing on international arbitration. Um, and within IAA, um, there are prescribed grounds for annulment, and they mostly reflect the Article 34 model law um, grounds for annulment, except that they add two additional grounds, well, one being fraud and corruption, and the other being breach of natural justice. Um, in terms of numbers, um, what is important is that out of these two legislations that you have, um, the vast majority, actually 88% um, 
of, of applications was filed under the IAA, whereas only two out of 25 applications were filed under AA. And of those applications that were filed under a, uh, a, 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 IAA, um, only 8% only um, of awards was actually annulled. 70% 70% of challenges remained um, remained remained inapplicable. So it wasn't it wasn't um, the success, the challenges were not successful. And that is something that is now that I think about very much aligned with what previous speakers said. Because although Dr. Sasson and Marco used different methods and uh, different years, um, our dossier dealt only with one year. Professor Dr. Sasson research dealt with 10 years. Um, I would say that the results are more or less aligned. Um, the grounds on which these awards were annulled um, were various, but I would say that the first place takes breach of natural justice. Around 30% of awards were annulled because of that. And that is also something that we should take into account especially because when you say breach of natural justice, it can include right to be, breach of right to be heard, uh, breach of in, independent and impartial arbitrator, and it is, it is a lot related to fact, fact pattern of the particular case. So that is something that we should definitely have, have in mind. Um, also for, might be important, but um, the subject matter of disputes that came before the courts of Singapore uh, were various. Um, shareholder disputes, energy, maritime, SPAs, uh, distribution agreements. Um, interestingly for me, none of the, of the disputes that involved shareholders agreements or energy disputes was annulled, but some maritime awards, awards dealing with maritime issues were. Um, and now that I think of all the award, of all the reports that our dossier has, I believe that they bring true value to both uh, practitioners and academics. Uh, they show reliable data, but we are thinking that we want something more and that we want to progress, which means that we are thinking about other projects. And the next project that we will be dealing with is the report about US courts. Um, we put a questionnaire that contains more detailed information because we want to know more. For instance, it would be very useful to know whether the judgments of US courts show when annulling uh, the awards, whether they show uh, the names of arbitrators uh, that uh, rendered that award. It would be interesting to know that. It would be also interesting to know if third party funders were involved in, in arbitrations. Who were they? Um, so we want to gather more detailed and I would say more distilled data that practitioners and academics could later, uh, could later use. Um, of course, there are a lot of questions to be, to be examined and analyzed and I completely agree with Marco when, when he said that this is a difficult job. Um, if this questionnaire and this U.S. report uh, produces really um, n useful results, I would say that we would continue with uh, spreading our work to other jurisdictions. Um, and of course, we will probably face difficulties in terms of civil law, common law. Sometimes you have jurisdictions such as Italy, Serbia absolutely falls in the same, in the same range where you have jurisdiction, uh, you have judgments that are rendered in the official language. Many of them are not published. You need to go physically through each and every hard copy to really try to understand what happened and that takes a lot of time. Uh, but um, be as it may, ultimately we really hope within the ARB dossier that um, its reports and its database will at one point soon, I hope, become uh, an indispensable tool for practitioners and for academics. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to make sure you know that those are freely available up to now. Okay. <laughs> you have to switch off. 
Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Professor Ferrari. Good evening, esteemed panel members. Um, I come from a law firm in India, Mumbai. Murt I'm Murtaza Federal, Federal and Company's law firm. Um, I thought I'll speak about the 2015 amendment in India, which came about to expedite arbitration and to make India an arbitration-friendly state. Uh, what did that amendment achieve, and what does the data show with respect to that achievement? The amendment was brought about to facilitate and enhance and make India the, uh, the country for bringing in arbitration. However, the amendments that were brought in were substantial from 2015 onwards, which continued in 2019 and 2021. The Law Commission report of 2014, which suggested the amendments which were then incorporated under 34 of the Arbitration Act, suggested that they made amendments to the public policy requirement as well as with respect to an explanation to bring it very narrow as to what could be a public policy challenge. Uh, they also put in an amendment with respect to what could be the difference between an international commercial arbitration award challenge and the domestic award challenge. And they allowed patent illegality for the purpose of the domestic award challenge. Despite the amendments, let us see how India fared with respect to this. India was ranked 178 out of 189 nations in the world with respect to contract enforcement. This was before they made an effort to start making out the amendments. Subsequently, after the amendments were carried out from 19 and 21, India is today still 163rd out of 190 nations in the world with respect to contract enforcement. Uh, what could be the reason why we haven't achieved the high status that we all wanted to. Uh, let us look at the time that it takes for disposal of the proceedings in India. After the amendment in section 34, a subsection was inserted which said that an application under this section shall be disposed of expeditiously and in any event within a period of one year from the date on which a notice referred to is served upon the other party. So we provided a period of one year the data collected by Arb dossier between June 2019 and May 2021 from the Bombay High Court uh, suggests that 51% were disposed within two years of filing. Out of these, 36% was within a year, 14% within six months, and 7% within three months. The remaining 49% were more than two years to be disposed of. The average time for deciding upon a setting aside application for the award in the Bombay High Court is 23 months and seven days. The statutory timelines provided in the act were not achieved for various reasons. Um, while the arbitration friendliness is important with respect to um, the disposal of cases, however, the reason for the slow rate of disposal, which were varied, is not something that the courts have been able to grip because of the number of matters pending in court, the sheer numbers that we have in the Bombay High Court. Now let's test the 2016 amendment with, uh, with respect to the stay of the award. Post-amendment figures, again researched by Arb Dossier uh, on the Bombay High Court, showed that a stay of the award was only granted in 11% of the cases, which prior to the amendment was for 100% of the cases. So while this was a great positive in the entire endeavor not to stay the award and to reduce the interference of courts in arbitration, eventually around 50% as per the study, 50% uh, of these awards were tested by court where 27% of these awards were finally set aside. This matches the figure that Dr. Monique Sasson mentioned, even for India, with respect to the number of awards being set aside. Um, from these numbers of the set aside, 2% were remanded back to the tribunal, 15% were partially set aside. Um, the interference of courts in India with respect to arbitration, while it reduced at the time of the interim stay, but increased at the time of setting aside of the award with 27%. Um, Despite all these efforts that India is taking and with respect to the amendments being brought about, the 15 Act, the 19 Act, and the 21 Act 
we are finding ourselves with respect to the bulk of cases and its disposal, the first, in head, the first in head, uh, interference. Um, with Arb Dossier's report, the way we are looking at the data that is being collected, how does it help us in India, for example, a firm like us and advising clients? What it does is it provides that backup data on the suggestions that we give clients during our meetings and during the strategy meetings that take place. And the data helps back, us this, uh, back our decisions, which we then put before clients with respect to what we need to do next. And it's always good to have a backing up of data to suggest your way forward because that is sometimes very important to not only show that why an advice is given, but also what is the basis of the advice. Um, Finally, I would like to take a moment to talk about Arp Dossier today. Uh, Devarsh Saraf, who is the co-founder of Arp Dossier, was someone who worked at the firm in Mumbai with me. And uh, he is somebody who came up with an idea, an idea at the firm that after listening to all the strategy meetings that took place, the arbitration uh, discussions with councils in the matter, as well as with, in the arbitration hearings, he one day came up with the idea, why can't we put all this data together and help you know, back it up when the numbers are all over the place. And if the numbers speak and they speak a language, that language will be heard and will be heard loud enough. So I'm glad he took up this idea and gave it a form because copyright does not express in an idea. It is actually in the form. He put it together in a form and he's now moving ahead with it. And I'm certain that this idea and the form will gain traction. Good luck to Abdossia. Good luck to everybody at Abdossia. Thank you very much. And we have the last panel. Um, two more speakers. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be in this classroom. Uh, and uh, I must say, this is a, a very, very fine classroom. Uh, and uh, <laughs> reminds me of many, many years ago when I was in a classroom, but not as grand as this. Um, it's a real honor to be here um, and um, on such an important topic. And Arb Dossier is a wonderful organization. I'm very privileged to be on the advisory board. Uh, as long as they'll have me, I'll do my best to um, make a contribution. Um, I see um, Jennifer Kirby here. Uh, I'll make sure I speak to her. Um, I had the privilege of um, appearing in front of her in, in a tribunal of three not that long ago. Um, I'm going to, I took, last night we had a very nice speaker's dinner and in the course of that dinner, uh, with Franco's permission, I changed my topics that I'm going to talk to because um, I'm uh, a lawyer from England and Wales, which, as you know, is a very arbitration-friendly jurisdiction. And we take it very seriously. And, um, and I'll go through a few points, but um, so I, I changed that. So I'm going to talk about three broad things. Uh, the first thing is what we've learned from our commercial court, which is the division of the English High Court where most... What, all of the arbitration claims brought, primarily challenges, are heard. Um, the commercial court um, prepares an annual report. And I'm going to talk about some of the points arising from the most recent report, which is very enlightening on the topics that we're covering today. The second thing is the further changes which um, the commercial court guide have brought in to make challenges to arbitral awards even less attractive. Um, and lastly, again, with um, the wonderful permission of Professor Ferrari, I'm going to be a little controversial and raise a few topics from a practical perspective as practitioners that I think we and our clients should be thinking about. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, is um, about the arbitration-friendly nature of England and Wales because um, for a very long time it has had a very strong global reputation for being an arbitration-friendly jurisdiction with a low level of intervention by the courts in attempted challenges to arbitral awards. And this is reinforced, as I mentioned in opening, 
uh, by the annual report of our commercial court, which is a very famous division of the English High Court, where, as I said, applications to challenge awards are made. Now, the most recent report covers the judicial year 2020 to 2021. The new report comes out very soon, uh, but uh, I took some interesting points from the most recent report, which gives a valuable, um, a valuable insight into the number of challenges made to arbitral awards before the English court and how they fare, because they just frankly don't fare very well. Um, and it reinforces, as I said, the non-interventionist approach of the English court to arbitration. And it's very hard to succeed uh, in England and Wales uh, in challenges to arbitral awards. And this message has been clear for a long time, and it's only getting reinforced more and more in things like the commercial court report in our law reports. Um, we don't see that many successful cases. And of course, and I'll turn to this, we have the adverse cost rule in England and Wales, which means that the loser pays most of the winner's legal costs. And that can be a very good tool to stop people um, being a little too creative when they try to challenge awards. So the trend which the commercial court um, report indicates also is that over the last five years, there's been a drop in the number of challenges made. Um, and this combined with the very high threshold which our judges impose uh, is good news for the fact that arbitration is such an important tool for dispute resolution and should be left to its own devices. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Mumbai chairing uh, the Global Arbitration Review um, Conference and our um, a keynote speaker, Justice Patel of the Bombay High Court, made a very interesting observation. And I think uh, a number of uh, you know, the Arb dossier colleagues were there um, and said, it's much better to have a few bad awards and let in the vast majority of awards because you'll always get a few bad awards. You always will, but that doesn't stop you being non-interventionist. So now in England and Wales, we have um, three main sections under which um, you can seek to challenge an award. Section 67, which deals with lack of jurisdiction of the tribunal. Section 68, which deals with a serious procedural irregularity. And section 69, which is a bit rarer, which is appeal on a point of law. And from the commercial court uh, report, um, it was very interesting. I pulled out some of the numbers. So, um, in, so under section 67, there were 15 applications made, of which a number had been dismissed at the time of the report, but 11 were still pending a decision. Uh, and I dare say most of those were rejected. Um, section 68, there were 25 applications, of which a number were rejected, and 14 were pending. Again, I would have thought a lot of that 14 would have been uh, turned down. And lastly, section 69, which had 35 applications, interestingly, but leave only granted in five of those cases. So I think, as I say, we can assume that when we see the new report, which will come out soon, we will see a, a large number of these uh, applications were um, refused. So the key messages which come out of that commercial court report, combined with the revisions last year to our commercial court guide, our procedural Bible for the commercial court, really reinforces that England and Wales is a very, very arbitration-friendly jurisdiction and that unfounded challenges to arbitral awards will be discouraged by the judges. And a number of the rule changes uh, have, are actually very, very important here. So historically, Section 67, where you could challenge the jurisdiction of a tribunal, was essentially an automatic right. It was, it, was, it, was, it was near enough something you could bring, albeit with the cost consequences if you lost it. But the rule changes now make this a much harder thing to bring. And you must show at the very outset in your evidence, which you file with your claim form, i.e. the writ, as it used to be called many years ago, um, you have to show the evidence which shows the substantial injustice that would be caused. Um, and and importantly, and I had a case on this recently, um, applications under Section 67 and 68 can be dismissed on paper without a hearing. 
And we had an, uh, a, a case recently where my team and I were defending an award that we'd got in our favour. The, uh, the, the other side brought a challenge in the English court and sought leave to uh, set aside the award. Um, the judge, in just in a couple of days of having the papers, much to our surprise, sent back a decision on paper saying dismissed with costs. So we got our costs uh, and we got the award um, solemnized uh, and enforceable. So extremely interesting rule changes. Those of you who would like to practice in England and Wales, and I encourage all of you to do that, um, I think you know, you'll, all be, you'll become very familiar with these rules before too long. So the strong message, as I say, is that England and Wales is a very arbitration-friendly jurisdiction, and that's really important post-Brexit. And I'm not going to talk too much about Brexit, but it's really important because arbitration and English law is one of our greatest exports um, f from England. Now, I'm going to finish uh, on a controversial, with some controversial points, which I've, again, with the permission of uh, <laughs> Professor Ferrari, I'm going to raise, which is this, and Bajana mentioned this in her uh, observations, uh, and we were talking about this last night. So many of the successful challenges to awards, and there aren't that many, or judgments that you read of the English courts on challenges, do not name the arbitral tribunal members. Now, I do not understand why. We should know who's sitting on these tribunals. It shouldn't just be by happenstance. You find out by speaking to a friend of yours at X firm or Y chambers that, oh yeah, they sat, oh yeah, those people sat in that case. It should be knowledge. You know, people um, sit as arbitrators because they are sitting to make decisions. If there are good decisions, fantastic. If there are bad decisions, of which there will inevitably be some, as Justice Patel said, fine. But the cost of arbitration, when you set aside an award or you remit part of an award back to the, the tribunal, these costs are huge. And, you know, we have to, I think... It's, it's important that judges should always say in their judgments who is sitting on these tribunals. I think it's very important. The, and I'd be interested if anyone has any contra thoughts, of course. You know, we, I'd like to hear from the audience at some point. The second point I would say is that um, some institutions uh, invoke the scrutiny of the award. Well, where is the scrutiny of the award when... Ch when awards are set aside or are in part annulled. You know, scrutiny has to mean something. It's not just a paper exercise. You know, I've had awards come back after scrutiny that have got typos in them, just, just peppered with typos. And, you know, that's not scrutiny. So I would say that's something else from a practical point of view, from a, a practitioner's point of view, I think we should also be thinking about. And the last point I would just make is, uh, is that this a collation of data is very important for all the reasons that my f fabulous panelists have already made, and I'm sure that I will also make these points. But it's the awareness that's really important. Arbitration is a global thing, and it has been for a long, long time. We need to get as much transparency into the system as we can. So were those my comments, Professor? And I'll yield to Devaj. Good evening, everyone. I am sure everyone here has enjoyed. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for that. I am sure everyone here has enjoyed uh, the speeches of my distinguished panelists as much as I have. And the topic for today's conference is actually one which is very close to my heart um, because I truly believe in the power of empirical data and its utility to legal professionals, lawyers, judges, and every other stakeholder who has an interest in legal proceedings. Last evening at the speaker's dinner, and even today, Mr. Bhattacharya mentioned that, you know, Justice Patel, and what he had said, that we should have a few bad awards slip in, you know, and let everything through, just so that we can have a slightly more arbitration-friendly jurisdiction. To give you some numbers behind this argument, in India, we have about 43% of the applications 
for setting aside awards are successful, which means about 43% of the applications made result in the award being set aside. To compare this with Singapore, which is considered, as Buyana rightly stated, as one of the world's leading arbitration hubs, only 25% of the applications are successful and the awards are set aside. That's almost a 100% difference between the two jurisdictions. So when you put these numbers behind a very strong argument, I believe that it, it adds a lot of support and it adds an element of rationality which is often missing in the way we conduct the practice of law. There's this quote that I love which Jim Barksdale, the former CEO of Netscape, made during one strategy meeting. Um, and Professor Ferrari, I know you also are quite a fan of this quote based on our discussions. He said, if we have data, let's look at the data. If all we have is opinions, let's go with mine. And I quite like this quote, and I think it reflects the power that data has in boardrooms, in decision rooms, and certainly in legal strategy rooms. There have been some lovely independent studies which have been conducted for years on you know, empirical uh, data by academics and practitioners. Dr. Sassos and Marcos are fine examples of these. However, there is no platform. So we all have Clua, we all have Yusmundi, we have Lexis, Westlaw, and you know, different variations of those in different countries. But we don't have a single platform for empirical research that lawyers can go to to consistently get information that they need pertaining to their research. That is what we seek to achieve with our dossier. And the hope is that in due course, um, along with the research, with the, along with the substantive research that arbitration practitioners conduct, uh, you know, they also do an ARB dossier search. And my hope is that at some point, Mr. Bhattacharya, you ask an associate who's just joined the firm, did you do an ARB dossier search in there? <laughs> and that would make you know, my heart swell with pride. And that's where we see the team going towards. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the ARB dossier journey, where it began, and why is a 25-year-old who has no business being on this panel with such experienced people speaking here today? So after graduating from law school in India, not that long ago actually, I had the opportunity of working at one of Mumbai's best boutique litigation and arbitration law firms, Federal and Company, under the tut tutelage of Mr. Murtaza Federal. He had a small team which focuses more on quality as opposed to quantity, and one of the benefits of that was that very early on, I had the opportunity, opportunity to sit in strategy meetings with clients and interact with them directly and feel their questions that they would ask us. Those clients would often ask us questions like, how much time do you think this is going to take? Should we settle this matter? Or should, do you think we should pursue this in a, co in a court of law? You know, what do you think is the probability that we'll win these cases? I'm sure most of you in this room have practiced law for some time. You all would have also fielded such questions from your clients. And I felt that while we, of course, consulted some of the most senior counsel, some of the most learned people in the profession on this, their opinions, I would like to say, were based more on their personal experience and based on pure human limitations. Even the most senior counsels, even the most experienced lawyers, handle only a small subset of the total number of cases. Yes, they may handle the highest value arbitrations, they may handle the most important arbitrations, but they certainly cannot handle all of the arbitrations or all of the applications surrounding these applications. In a bid to try and gather some empirical data because of this problem, I was coaching, I was, had the good fortune of coaching a VIS team from my law school, and I asked them after the moot was done to, if they'd be interested in doing some arbitration research in an empirical way. And fortunately for me, they said yes. Along with a colleague and these lovely research assistants of mine, we decided to do a study in the Bombay High Court. And we sought to publish the study um, on a blog at the time, which we called Arb Dossier. The first rendition of Arb Dossier's website was made after long days work, a long days at Federal and Company's office. Murtaza really did not let me go early, I can promise you. Um, so I would sit from about 12 a.m. or 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., you know, developing the website. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but 
throughout this entire process, whenever I'd speak to uh, Mr. Federal about this, he was always very encouraging. And he'd always say, I think you're on to something here. And that always kept us going. After publishing a couple of Indian reports, we were fortunate to have a young Singapore law firm reach out to us, Sylvester Legal. And he and the managing partner of that firm, Mr. Walter Sylvester, asked us if we could do a study for Singapore. And we asked him to assist us with the study since we did not have the local nuance that a study for Singapore would require. And he came aboard as the head of our Singapore chapter. The next chapter in Abdose, and one of the most important ones I'd like to believe, began over a meal that I was having with a very dear family friend of mine, Devansh Jalan, a very dynamic law student who, while he was in law, student, while, while he was in law school, actually obtained two patents pertaining to electric vehicles, the only law student in the world to have patents to his name, and one of the youngest Indians at the time to have secured a patent of such a nature. And he, at that time, he was considering joining some of the largest consultancy firms in the world, and he was telling me, based on all his knowledge, that I think Abdos has a lot of inherent value, and we should probably, you, know, you should probably stop looking at it as a blog and consider the, taking this a little more seriously. And of course, I, I mean, I had no training in the business side of things. He seemed to have some acumen for that. So I asked him to join on board. And today, uh, I'm very, very proud to say that he is the CEO of Arb Dossier. And most of our achievements since then, I think, can be said to be solely attributable to him. When I came to New York to pursue my LLM at Columbia Law School, I know we don't utter those words out here, Professor, but... <laughs> I did not use bad words. I don't <laughs> want you to use... Well, when I came here to New York to pursue my LLM, I was thrilled about studying at what I thought then was my dream school. Uh, but I was a little upset that I would not get the opportunity to learn from Professor Ferrari. Some of my batchmates I see here in, in the audience today, and they also shared similar feelings, Professor, I can promise you that. I remember I'd quoted Professor Ferrari's work at every single moot that I'd done while in law school. And when I happened to meet Boyana at a networking event, and I mentioned this to her, she asked me if I'd be willing to sneak into one of Professor Ferrari's lectures. And that was an opportunity I could not pass on. So I snuck into the NYU campus. I did not have the access, and I did not fill in the form, as all of you here did today. And we overheard that. We have to cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I spoke to Professor Ferrari after that, and he was kind enough um, you know, to invite me to his office after for a chat. And when I told Professor Ferrari about the Arb Dossier project, he immediately saw the potential in it. And well, here we are today. Boyana as well loved the project that we're doing, and we're proud to have her as our chief editor of Arb Dossier. We've had a lot of good luck along this journey as well. Um, when I was having a coffee here, out here in New York, I happened to speak to somebody who turned out to be the editor of Forbes, and she invited Devansh and I for the Forbes Under 30 conference, where we met some AI specialists and artificial intelligence and technology specialists who have now started working with us. And all of the data that we were doing, in a, you know, collecting in a manual way, we're looking now to collect um, you know, using AI and technology. And Arb Dossier was also selected for the Stanford Seed Spark program, where we have some professors from the business school mentoring us, uh, much needed considering how accidental of an entrepreneur uh, we both are and to try and help us to hone the skills that we would need uh, while engaged in such a venture. We've also had the honor of Mr. Bhattacharya speaking at quite a few of our seminars, um, and he even invited us, as he mentioned, for the GAR conference, and he even mentioned Abdos and the Toast, and that really meant a lot to us and the entire team um, out here. That having been said, Abdos's early reports certainly encapsulated our idea, and under the guidance of our advisory board, and after long discussions with Professor Ferrari, we've realized that everything that we do can always be improved. And what we started off with, uh, we've tried to, we've now, we're now working to structure our reports more systematically, to conduct these reports a lot more systematically, so that they're more useful to practitioners and academics. I'm pleased today to formally announce um, the first USA report, which will, as Boyana referred to, which will be called the Abdosia Ferrari report. We are almost, we've started 
the work on this project and it will have almost thrice as many data points as our previous reports and it will cover almost all if not all of the different types of applications before courts and this is a major improvement I'd like to believe from what we had and we took a lot of uh, learnings as well Dr. Sasso from your report which as Boyana rightly stated in her toast last evening is very much the gold standard for what we seek to achieve on a consistent basis. We're also in the works of expanding to certain different jurisdictions, um, thanks to Professor Ferrari. And also, we're, based on a suggestion that we had from one of our team members, contacting authors of existing empirical work and converting them all to a consistent format and a searchable format so that lawyers and practitioners can easily research um, from, you know, from all of that research which has been done. I really hope all of you here uh, will soon say that you've referred to an ARB dossier report while working on a matter. Um, and we hope that we can make a meaningful contribution to the field of international arbitration. I'd like to end uh, my short speech today by thanking all of, my, uh, all of the panelists for being here, some of whom who have really, flown a really long way uh, to sit here with us. And I'd also like to thank Professor Ferrari, because I'd like to believe that ideas uh, transcend jurisdictions, they transcend geography, and they certainly transcend law schools. <laughs> so that, I yield the floor back to Professor. So you understand why I was charmed by this person when I met him first. So um, we have a lot of time for questions. We have a lot of time for you to make some remarks. I know that at least one colleague in the audience believes that maybe not annulling awards is a good thing. Um, so any questions relating to what we have said, relating to how you can use this data, how you can use data that will be provided. And as um, you just mentioned, some of the reports, and five have been published, and you can look at them, of course, were reports that were based on questionnaires 1.0. Um, and you and uh, Bojana, you did actually prepare a questionnaire. We looked at it and it is much more detailed. It should solve some of the question, or at least it should address some of the questions that you, for example, Marco mentioned. I thought that it was interesting that you said that the rate of success of annulment applications in Italy in relation to arbitral awards rendered by a sole arbitrator compared to those rendered by a tribunal of three or more is exactly the same. And I think, as we all know, this is not really the wisdom. And people are talking about, as you mentioned yourself, Marco, that maybe a three-member arbitral tribunal is better suited to render a decision that can withstand annulment proceedings, but we know it is not. I wonder, and this goes to um, you, for example, Monique and Marco, have you looked into whether there is a difference between ad hoc arbitrations compared to institutional arbitration? Because as you know, institutions sell themselves, at least those who do, as you mentioned, the scrutiny as adding value because they have somebody else, a court or members of the court, to look at it and therefore allow the outcome of that scrutiny process to withstand better um, annulment proceedings. Would any of you, have you had a chance to look into this? Yes, we did. Um, so, um, for, from the data, there is no difference. So, <laughs> and uh, we, so ad hoc arbitration was more, the percentage was more or less 6%. Between six and seven percent of the entirety. So, I, anecdotally, I would have thought it was more, but instead, it's not. It's really a minor part. But we couldn't see any impact on uh, enforcement or a setting aside. Marco, were you able as well? And yes. So we we haven't cross-checked the data. Um, what we found, however, and I think this goes back to the idea of consistency also in how the judgments are rendered and the ease with which one could like gather data from judgments, that it was quite unusual for Italian judges to specify whether the award was ad hoc or institutional. 
which of course renders complex to determine what is the impact of the of possibly the added value of an institution. Really. I see uh, Dirk de Möhlenmeister, who is actually this month's fellow at the center here at NYU. Please, you have a question, and the former president of CEPAN. Thank you. I had a follow-up question for um, uh, Monique and for, um, I can't uh, say your last name, Marco. Can I say Marco? Um, the, well, first on the scrutiny. Because you have to get closer to the mic, sorry. Okay. Just uh, uh, quickly on, 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 on a, on a follow-up question, but when it comes to scrutiny, let's bear in mind, even at the ICC, where a court member does a, an actual study of the award, I don't think they actually look into the file. Uh, so you, we have to be careful there, and especially a lot of institutions like the Belgian uh, Arbitration Institution, we do formal scrutiny. Does it make sense? And if it makes sense, we let it go. But the, the question I had was, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, Monique, uh, minimalist and maximalist approach, uh, de novo review, obviously is related to that, revision au fond. Uh, and I actually have two questions. And it was also mentioned arbitration friendly. Do you have, do you have figures on uh, partial annulment of awards? and uh, situations where a judge would send the award back to the tribunal in order to remedy it, because that, of course, is an expression, I think, of, a, of an arbitration-friendly environment. And then another question is, is there a distinction when it comes to an award on jurisdiction? Because there we often see that a court will allow itself to have a more closer look to the award or an actual de novo review of the award and, uh, and revisit the facts and the merits. I so um, we, uh, so on partial award, we didn't. We tried to, uh, but the data from the judgment. No, partial annulment. Sorry, partial uh, yeah. annulment. We looked at the, um, at the data, but we couldn't, because these are all judgments, but they are selected. So we 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 could we we found some but we couldn't follow them <laughs> so we didn't know whether it was really sent back what happened so i would say that on the first one the data did not assist us on the second point on jurisdiction i um so um i like the uk example of section 67 when it's very clear jurisdiction no jurisdiction etc and uh, uh, what's happened there whether it is a de novo review or not not in many other countries is so clear, the jurisdiction point. So for example, I wrote an article on a comparison between US and UK, because uh, setting aside an award on jurisdiction, it, if it doesn't fall into the New York Convention, uh, sort of if the set aside follows the New York Convention reasons to, um, to oppose recognition and enforcement, you don't have a, a clear category on jurisdiction. So the issue is that uh, um, as a practitioner, I like Section 67 of the Arbitration Act very much. It's very clear, makes England and the Arbitration Act an example of how it should be effort. Unfortunately, we don't have the same equivalence in uh, um, the uh, UNCITRAL model law. And so what we did when we looked at, at the database, now, first of all, the data set is public. Who wants to have uh, um, the two, so I have two extra copies of what we did, but the data set is public and who wants to have, please reach out to me and I will send you the link. But in the data set, we use the UNCITRAL model law. So we divide it by the category, of uh, uh, so in New York Convention and specular to that set aside with the New York Convention. So we didn't have a clear jurisdiction, uh, because, but there was a thinking behind it because we liked the Section 67 when we found it difficult to find it in other jurisdictions. Okay, I heard you actually refer to partial annulment at one point, please. Yes, actually we, we, we managed to find that data on the judgments. We found there was a 4% of partial annulments in Italy. Under Italian arbitration law, it's possible to annul a part of the award if it's sendable from the other parts. And this is what happened. And actually, with, with the risk of going back to anecdotal evidence we mentioned before, I mean, remembering from many of the judgments of partial annulment they I read, oftentimes those heads were kind of minor in terms like monetary, for instance, they dealt with the allocation of legal fees, 
or in any case, there were annulments that did not touch upon the core of the claims raised by the parties and adjudged by the, the tribunal. And just a quick note on the second question about the referral of awards back to arbitral tribunal. Arbitration, Italian arbitration law is a bit peculiar on that, so depending on the grounds and also on whether the party are national or international, there is a different procedure on whether the arbitral award can kind of refer, like get back the matter and adjudge the matter again. But I think this is something, for instance, I have like an avenue of research that would be worth exploring, as it would be worth looking, these were courts of appeal judgments, what happened before the Supreme Court of Cassation, if they were upheld or reversed. So I do think there is a lot of room for improvement in terms of empirical studies on that. Katam, you Yes, thank you. Um, no, it's a great question because um, in England and Wales, there is no empirical data on, on partial set-asides or remitting back to the tribunal. We get this by a very boring procedure, which is reading the judgments. And, uh, and I'm one of those boring people who, who, if I see judgments come out on arbitration decisions, I read them. And um, it's important because this, this is where you get the, uh, the information, but we need proper studies on this because, you know, the English courts have a philosophy that they would rather remit part of an award than set aside. And the, the law reports indicate that. So just in the last few years, there's been some very interesting cases, one involving, well, a number involving um, uh, BIT arbitration. And there was a very interesting case involving the Republic of Kazakhstan and Worldwide Minerals, a, a case where a part of the award was remitted back, but the vast majority was kept intact. Then there was another case, which was a, a, a commercial arbitration, where again, it was partially remitted. So setting aside in toto is actually a nuclear option. And you know, one of the most famous ones was a, a 2015 case involving the uh, a UK government ministry and Raytheon, where the judge set aside the, the, the award totally. And this is, so back to my example, the, the controversial thing that uh, I was raising earlier on. That was a case that was, it was about a six month hearing, which was extraordinary by any measure. You think what the legal fees were in that case. But uh, there was no transparency on who the arbitrators were, but yet the thing was set aside. Anyway, I, I'm mindful of time, but it's a fascinating topic that you've just touched on. We have a lot of time for more questions. Yes, please, Albert. Thank you, Professor. Um, I have a question in relation to the arbitral institutions. Um, because I've worked in institutions before, and then I have the liberty to scrutinize um, some arbitral awards. As much as I would love to go to the substance, commenting um, the tribunal's uh, decisions on the merits, but as also pointed out, our hands are tied um, because according to our rules, we're only supposed to draw the attention of the tribunal on the perceived irregular irregularities without affecting the tribunal's uh, liberty on the decisions of its merits. So I guess my question is that should institutions assume more role in um, scrutinizing their award, should they have higher level of scrutiny, or on top of the scrutiny of award, should they have more measures to maximize the chance of enforcement of award? Um, yeah, thank you. But look, all of us who have acted as arbitrator under the rules of those institutions who have scrutiny know that what you said is wishful thinking. In fact, I think you used the word supposed to. A lot of these institutions do not limit their comments to form. Absolutely not. No, um, dear, I mean, maybe Sepani, but that's the only one I haven't used yet. But um, if you look at others, it is not just about form, and we know that. Not only, not only. You get the draft back, and the parties are advised that the, it was approved. Subcondizione, it is nothing to do with form. So. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, Albert, some of the rules say that, but not all arbitral institutions hold themselves to their own rules, and I think this is experience we have. Okay. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm also Professor, like Professor Ferrari mentioned, from the other side of town, and I came all the way here. <laughs> and I actually snuck in here with Devarsh for your talk uh, back in, I think it was November. But my question particularly is directed towards uh, the team uh, at Arb Dossier. Uh, what kind of challenges do you face while researching for the empirical data that is used in the ARP dossier reports eventually, and uh, how do you then eventually overcome those challenges as a business uh, while maintaining, uh, uh, you know, I guess, low costs, since uh, we're, we're a startup and uh, we have those concerns. But, um, yeah. Um, so we do face quite a few challenges while collecting our empirical data. The first challenge, of course, is how do we get the data. Um, in, I, I think this has been referred to uh, by Marco and some other speakers as well. You know, in Italy, they've gone physically to courts. In India, we filed right to information applications, which have often taken months. That's how we started. Uh, we also noticed that certain judges tended to sit on certain kinds of matters. So we actually ran searches by the rosters, and we tried a lot of algorithms. It was very painful. It took us, I think, a few weeks to get our first data set. Um, thankfully, Devansh and a few of the tech geniuses that we have on the team have managed to get that down to a few minutes, which makes me feel really bad for those weeks that I lost. But um, another big issue that we face is that court orders are not um, homogeneous. They don't use the same terminology. Uh, a lot of them miss out on very crucial pieces of information from an empirical standpoint. So while they would have a lot of legal reasoning and that reasoning on the law would be, um, you know, quite detailed, they would not mention certain details as, you know, Mr. Bhattacharya, uh, as, as was previously pointed out as well, they, would, they often do not mention the names of the arbitrators. So from an empirical standpoint, those are some big challenges because empirically it would be so interesting for us, I think, and I'm sure it would be interesting for everyone in this room as well, to know how many arbitrators have passed how many awards, how many of those awards have been set aside, how many applications have been filed pertaining to these arbitrators. Just that information would allow parties to make, you know, a lot more rational decisions, a lot more informed decisions while deciding who to appoint um, on tribunals and, you know, probably even, I would dare say, who to appoint as counsel in those cases if we have the right information. In fact, the new questionnaire is much more detailed, as was mentioned earlier already. In fact, it tries to look into whose award is being challenged, but that is important for a lot of reasons, because suppose you get the information, then you can look into a lot of other issues that are, of course, important. For example, Diversity. This is one of the reasons why Bojana and you too did actually include it. So one would be able to see who did decide, but not to blame somebody. Sometimes they're really bad, so they should be blamed. But uh, sometimes it's also just to get more information and uh, allow the use of this information by people interested in other things than, for example, annulment, as we may be today here. But um, the U.S. questionnaire, let's call it this way, is much more detailed and will allow one to um, have more data on different issues and it is clearly not limited to annulment, um, at least not the one I saw. Other questions? We have time, so if you have questions, please, you won't get these colleagues here in one room again. It seems like you silenced everyone with your last comments, okay? <laughs> so um, I really thank all of you for coming, um, but I mostly thank the people at Arp Dossier. I thank our colleagues for flying across oceans, more than one, for being here. Thank you very much. I thank, of course, also uh, Monique for having done the research we used. Marco, you too. I hope to see it published hopefully in English, apart from Italian. I say that because it is necessary that people know that arbitration in Italy is an option and it may be quicker than court litigation. Thank you to everyone. And before you go, a few things. Um, the center is being active again. So we have another event on the 24th of March 
here again at NYU. It's a third intergenerational arbitration symposium where very young scholars are allowed to present their papers. We have colleagues from France coming, graduates from Washington, and of course some graduates here from New York, and some people in the room will act as commentators, meaning we are a little more seasoned and will comment on them. And the center is also organizing a conference in Vienna on the 31st of March. It's a conference on CISG-related matters. Then with the IAA, there will be a conference on the 3rd of April here again on arbitration-related matters, including, for example, AI and arbitration. That will be one. We have a two-day conference in honor of Professor Linda Silberman and her retirement. We will have um, colleagues from all over the world fly in to honor her. There will be sections on jurisdiction, section on conflict of laws, sections on arbitration and transnational litigation. On the 27th of April, again here at NYU, there will be a research seminar where some of the participants in this year's IBRLA LLM program at NYU will present their papers, including several papers on what makes a jurisdiction arbitration friendly, of course. Another interesting topic is, of course, that of what makes a model law country a model law country, because we know that there are no set criteria, and a lot of other topics. And on the 28th, the following day, here, we will organize a conference on deference, together with George Berman from Brooklyn. No, no, it's not Brooklyn, okay? From another school here in New York. Um, our colleague, um, Professor uh, Kimmelman, he will also be here. We have other colleagues who authored chapters in a book I'm editing on deference. And then, fortunately, the semester will be over. So thank you very much. Hope to see you again soon. <laughs>